So while we're waiting for more people to come on, I wanted to just give you guys a heads up. So if you haven't seen already, we have a giveaway that's up and live starting yesterday and it's gonna go on for the next two weeks. Uh, all you need to do is comment with a heart emoji and tag two friends. Don't forget to share the post on your story and then tag uh, PodMed Adventures, Katarina DPM, and Medi Things. So uh, today we, our guest speaker is going to be Dr. Katarina and we're going to talk a lot about boards, fellowship, and a little bit about uh, diabetes. So depending on how much time there is. And uh, again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the question box. I have a feeling there's gonna to be tons of questions. I know I do. Um, so without further ado, again, my name is Shelby. Uh, our guest speaker today is Dr. Katerina Grigoropoulos. And then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me in PodMed Adventures for our little go live where we talk about boards and fellowship. Um, if you cannot hear me at any point, let me know because I know the phone is in a little bit of a weird position here. I can hear you fine right now, so it's looking good. Hi guys, what's going on? Um, I just want to say that we'll be talking, we'll have discussion about everything you guys want to talk about. If you guys have any questions during the discussion, please feel free to leave a comment and we can address them as you guys give us our questions that you guys have and we'll do our best to answer them. All right. So I think like just starting off, um, so in second year, I know after second year, we take boards part one and there's boards part two that you take in fourth year. Um, and then boards part three, which is the one that, that you're studying for right now. So if you want to like, I don't know, kind of like give a synopsis of like what all that is about. Yeah. So I'll definitely kind of go into that. So, um, like you said, after your first year or after your second year, you take part one. So let me kind of just branch out the, the different types of board exams. So the NBPME, which is the national board of podiatric medicine examiners has three types of uh, boards. So the first one you take after your second year. Um, the second one you take around the times that you, around the time in your fourth year where you do your interviews. And then the third one, you have basically three options of when you can take that exam. Um, you can take it after you're done with school, right before residency even starts, you can take it in June. Um, the second option is during your first year of residency, you can take it that December. Or what you can do is basically after your first year of residency, you can take it that, that following June. So your time frames for the NBPME part three is June, December of your first year or June of your first year. Um, okay. So you have uh, basically three options of when you want to take it. So okay. for us, there were some of my classmates that were like part three. I heard it's fairly easier compared to part one and two. We just finished school. Everything's kind of fresh in our brain. We just want to get it over with. So some of my classmates did end up taking it in June. Um, some of my co-residents, some of my other classmates ended up taking it December of their first year. I ended up taking mine uh, June after basically my first year of residency. I felt um, in my mind, I was like, you know, I really want to use the time that we have off in June to really kind of decompress, travel with my family, really use that time to um, kind of prepare myself for residency and do mm -hmm. any sort of last minute traveling that I wanted to do. And then in my mind, in my mindset, I was like, well, how better, how better more can you prepare yourself than undergoing a whole full year of residency yeah. Um, yeah. under yeah. part three? So, okay. you know, some people like to take it in December because they're like, I just want to get it over with. Or some people like to take it before residency starts because they're like, I just, you know, want to get it done and really focus in residency. For me, I felt like I would have so much learning to do during residency and throughout residency that I felt like what that would prepare me best for just taking it. And I really wanted to have my June off basically. Um, so I ended up taking part three, uh, the June after my first year. And okay. for that, just doing residency alone is a really good preparation for that. Um, but the number one thing that I studied for part three was the pod Bible pocket pod. <laughs> That's basically what I read. Um, and it's funny because one of the students told me once that 
they were asking me about part two, part three, and stuff like that. Yeah. And they were like, oh, so you didn't do the rule of twos? I was like, what's that? What's that? Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, oh, part one, you study for two months. Part two, you study for two weeks. And part three, you just bring a number two pencil. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I thought that was just so funny because I, I've heard it multiple times from different people. So I thought it was kind of funny. I don't recommend just showing up to any board exam. You should definitely prepare. Yeah. Um, find your weak points and really emphasize that. But I really do feel like, at least for me, the best option was to take it after my basically full year of residency was done and just take it in, in June. Um, and then after all the NBPME part, one, two, and three is done, you're, you're kind of done with those board exams. And then you have first, second year of residency, and then your third year of residency, which I'm in right now, mm -hmm. then you start kind of studying for the different board certification exams. So when you get to your third year, um, you have basically two routes to go. You can do both or you can pick which one you want to get board certified in. Okay. So the first type of board certification you can do is through getting certified through the ABFAS, which is the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery, okay. or you can go uh, the medicine route and get certified through um, ABPM, which is the American Board of Podiatric Medicine. Now, I get a lot of questions, oh, well, if I take the medicine board, I can't do surgery. No, that's definitely not true. If okay. you get board certified under the medicine division, you can certainly do surgery and continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, what really limits people with which board exam they take is where they eventually want to work um, and what their hospital or what their private practice or what their situation requires of them to do. So some okay. hospitals uh, that are in big academic facilities, they would want their physicians that they're getting hired to be ABFAS certified. Um, some require both boards, some require only one um, of your choosing. So it really depends on how flexible you want to be in your career um, with what kind of board that you want to get certified in. My goal is I want to get certified in both. I think that's a smart route to go in because you're you basically open up more doors for you regardless if you want to do private practice or if you want to do more of an academic setting. Right, right. So those are the two routes that you can go through. Um, do you guys have any questions about that so far? Let me see. I'm trying to see if people have any questions. I know people have questions. I don't see them popping up in here. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the question box or you can put it in the comments. Um, so it looks like someone has a question. Uh, they're from Nigeria. They're a medical student. Um, how possible is it for this person to pass the board exam if they're taking it from, from Africa? So the thing know. is, um, the USMLE is more for MD and then DO programs. For us in the physician, in the, I'm sorry, in the practice that we're in, we're taking our boards under the NBPME. So it's a little bit different and it's a completely different board path than the USMLE. Sorry, that, that phone physician <laughs> is not the best. No worries. Um, so if you're from an outside country um, that is interested in doing podiatry, you, in order to do the NBPME, you will most likely have to come to a medical school here that's podiatric medical school. The USMLE is another territory of examinations that we don't take as uh, podiatry students and physicians. I hope that helps. Yeah. I, so actually, have a, a I actually have a, a question. So sure. when it comes to these two, um, I actually wasn't aware like when you take part three. So it seems like part three, there's a couple different options and it kind mm -hmm. of spans. It's like, Let's say you decide to take part three um, before you start residency. So technically, would you be taking part two and part three in the same year? Because yep. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it would okay. only be you would take part two in January, and uh -huh. then you have the option to take part three in June of okay. the same year or December of the same year. Okay, or do like what you did where you took it at the end of your first year of residency. Exactly. So, okay, yeah. okay. And then when it comes to the uh, the ones that you're studying to take right now, um, are there certain time frames that each one is offered since there's two different certifying boards? Are they around the same time? Are they different? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, so anybody that is taking the ABFAS, so let me kind of go back a little bit. Um, in order to take 
to get board certified, there's two step process for each, the ABFAS and the ABPM. So the first part is to get qualified. So you would take your qualification exam. And then the second part, which is later on down the road, is your certification exam where you actually get certified to become board certified for that either if it's like medicine or surgery. So right now the third years that are in their residency that are trying to get, you know, that are studying for their boards, yeah. um, they're studying for part one. So they're, whether they're doing it for surgery or they're doing it for medicine, they are studying for their part one, which is the qualification exam. Um, okay. For anybody that is taking the ABFAS, the surgery qualification exam, that's going to be March 11th. Okay. So less than a month away. And oh, yes. The ABPM is going to be offered, the first part, which is the qualification exam, is going to be offered May 19th. So we're okay. all going to be taking them on those dates, whoever wants to get um, qualified to become certified later on. Okay. So it's a two-step process, and I can go into a little bit about uh, the time frame for each if you guys want. Yeah, no, that would definitely be helpful. I do have, um, there's a question uh, it's going to go live. So how does failing APMLE part one affect your future and getting into a good residency? So, you know, a lot of people put so much weight on grades, on boards and everything like that. I really do feel that some people just have really bad testing days. And if you have like a really good GPA and you're studying and you have all these extracurriculars and you just have a bad testing day and it just goes to crap and you fail, yeah. I wouldn't give up. Um, I would definitely be resilient, take it again, study, study as much as you can, figure out what your flaws were and just mm -hmm. retake it. Um, when it comes to residency and getting a program, there have been some of my friends that have failed the first part or the second part and they got into really good residencies. Okay. Um, was it their first choice? May, may or maybe not, you know, it really depends. I don't think you should completely press the quit button after you fail one exam. I mean, um, your chances of getting to like the best program in the United States of America might be a little <laughs> bit different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but everyone is so different. I really wouldn't put that much weight on and so much pressure on yourself if you fail one exam. Just retake it. Um, is it going to be on your transcripts or when you send the board um, scores to the programs? Yeah, it's going to show that you took it twice. Mm -hmm. But if you have so many other good things on your application, service work, your grades are good, um, you are involved, there's like community service, you know, you did you did amazing on your rotations, people are going to overlook that. Um, I think, and being on the opposite side now during residency, when we look at applications, when we do so much work on, you know, figuring out who we want to take into our yes. program, and who we want to join our team, we literally, you know, look at, yes, okay, they did good on their boards, you know, they have good GPA, mm -hmm. but how do they fit in our team emotionally? How do they fit work ethic wise? I think there's so much more that can be said on a person with the month of rotation and getting to know them and their effort to really put in the work and be a team player that I think outshines just passing boards or failing boards you know mm -hmm. if there's a repetition of failing you fail twice you fail three times you know that can definitely affect your chances but if you fail the first exam and let's say you pass the rest and you have so many other things in your application that really bulk up who you are as a candidate i think that you should be on the right track i don't think you should give up just by one exam i mean we all have bad testing days i took the mcat twice a lot of people don't know that um, going back to that, like after college, I was like, oh yeah, the MCAT, let's just try to see what I get the first time without barely studying. I that did the same like thing. Same that thing. was so dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Why did yeah. I do that? <laughs> and then I took a year off and I'm like, that was so stupid of me just to take an exam, just to see what I get. I don't yeah, even yeah. know what I was thinking. And, uh, I took a year off. I worked, I studied and then significantly better after I studied. So yeah, could I have let that first exam really like derail me and dictate the rest of my career and be like, you know what, this isn't for me? Sure. I was to the point where I'm like, maybe I should do something else. But then deep down, I was like, just do it. Try again. Get up. Try again. Study. Yeah. And one and day these boards, the NVPME part failing part one, part two, no one's going to look back after you get into residency and you get a job and you're happy with everything that is going on in your life. So to answer your question, um, 
there's so much more stuff in your application that makes you who you are and you shouldn't put that much emphasis on that. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, from, from a couple of the other like residency programs um, that we've gotten to know about, I mean, they all seem really good and it doesn't, you know, really doesn't seem like you're going to be missing out if you don't go into one residency versus the other. So residency, um, so, yeah. 100%, I think it's what you make it. Um, yeah. There are programs that I think are more demanding on the schedule, that are more demanding on the caseload, that are more demanding of expectations of their residents. But right. it's also how much work you're really you're willing to put in and how much outside learning you're willing to do and how much you volunteer to learn at, at your job and that residency and um there is a difference with the type of, you know, technique that you can learn. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's three years out of your career that it's not going to make you or break you. It's going to definitely be very important in setting the foundation um, for your first job and right. for the learning that you have to do in your career. But I don't think there's anything of like a bad residency because all these residencies yeah. go through all these qualifications and all these exam, you know, they, they have all these criteria for a reason. Right. Um, so let's say you don't get into your first one. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Like you, get, you should be hoping that you get in somewhere and then you, you know, the biggest thing is not going where it's the most academic or it's the, the biggest name. It's going where you're happy and where you feel like you're going to fit in as a person and be yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree. I agree. Um, I think so. We have a question from Mackenzie Obert. Uh, what would you consider a good GPA for residency? She's uh, first year. Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> because every program is different. And I've talked to other residents from other programs and every program has such a wide range of different GPA. And just because you have a lower GPA doesn't mean, you know, you're scratched off the board of so many residents and so many residency lists and stuff. Um, what I would say is a competitive GPA is anything above a 3.5. Um, that's putting you in kind of graduating in the honors range, depending on what school you're from. Um, there is a competitive GPA, but I wouldn't say what a good GPA is. Um, it, it's hard to put a number on that. Anything above a three, I think, puts you in a good um, space to be, you know, competitive to the programs that are uh, like in the average, like if you see it at the bell curve, I mm -hmm. would say like a three puts you at a safe place. Anything below a three, you know, two, two, six, two, seven, you know, it might kind of disqualify you from the higher programs, but, or like the more competitive programs, the more academic programs. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, when it comes to residency picking, it's amazing how global of a perspective people have on, on individuals, which being a student, I didn't know that that was the thing. Like, I thought it was yeah. like, we were just numbers. What did you get on your, you know, did you pass your boards? What was your class? Right. What were your GPAs and everything like that? Um, but to say what's a good, it's really hard to answer that because so many programs are different. But if you do look at the residency manual, um, that has like a breakdown of every program. Mm -hmm. There is a criteria um, that there's like a, a GPA requirement that they like to look at and that they like their candidates to have. Um, so definitely look at that if there's certain programs that you're interested in going. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to say because you're more than just a number. And I don't like to be like, oh, this is a good GPA and that's a bad GPA. But I would say that anything above a 3.5 is competitive and anything under that you know, people are going to look at more than just the application. Um, to kind of piggyback on that, there have been 4.0 people that have not gotten into their number one program. You know, there have been like 4.0s that I knew personally in, in school that were too in their head to get into the, mm -hmm. you know, the most academic program, the most with the surgical numbers that they kind of lost themselves as a person of who they were because all they thought people would see is a four on paper and that's that. Um, right. I don't think that's true. I think people want to work with people that, you know, are going to contribute to be a team player that are going to have good patient care that you can rely on versus just a number. So I really do think um, that there's yeah, more to than just GPA. Uh, what would globally help their resume? So Research. I had absolutely no research when I was a student. Uh, I did no research because I thought that I didn't like it. I was like, research is not for me. I'm not going to do it. So I just didn't. And then when it came to applying for residency, right on the front page, it literally was like <laughs> name, school, 
uh, address and then your publications and research and mine was completely blank. That was the first page and I was like, hmm, maybe I should have done something. Now in residency, I love research. I love case studies. I love all this different stuff because I, I had to be exposed to it. You know, we have to do yeah. stuff in residency and I was forced to do it and I ended up loving it. So, so what is back, research kind of like, I mean, I think like there's, there's a lot of ambiguity as far as like what, what are in those boxes when you're applying to residency? Like what are different types of things that would qualify as research? Like, do you need to do wet lab stuff? I mean, I think like a no, lot of it. You yeah. don't. Um, Research, to go back, can be anything that you've done in undergrad or anything that you did in pediatric medical school. Um, okay. So some of my friends did, like, a little microbiology, like, case study when in during their undergrad, and they were able to put that on, like, their publications, anything that was okay. published in, like, a journal of any sort. Um, so most of it is more, like, publications. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, like, the front page, I remember, in our application wasn't really, like, research projects that... Um, you did as like a poster form, it was more publication. So if you get involved in like um, a research, like a gate lab at school or anything regarding to like foot and ankle, you can certainly have like a team going that, you know, if they publish something and you contribute to that, you can mm -hmm. certainly put that on the application uh, okay. or even in your undergrad. So anything would qualify from undergrad to the end of podiatric medical school and you can do research in anything. Okay. Um, I had one of my colleagues that had done research with ants in undergrad, and they were able to put that on there. So it's really anything. So um, research is definitely, I think, something that, because not so many people have that on their application. So when people do have that, and we're finding that more and more and more applicants are starting to have that on their applications, mm -hmm. it really looks good, um, especially if you're trying to go somewhere really academic, because, you know, if you're already doing residence, or if, I'm sorry, if you're already doing research in podiatric medical school and undergrad, then you're going to be more inclined to know how to do it and to be interested in doing it in residency. Okay. Um, so that's important, I think. Uh, community service, I think, is very important because you don't only want to seem like you're just there for grades and books and reading and exams. You want to have a global perspective of yourself as a person. How would you represent yourself as a resident? Are you just going to go there, do the work, you know, do notes yeah. and leave, or are you going to have compassion, good patient care, um, kind of reach out and do good in the world? If you do stuff like that, I think that really shows who you are as a person versus just, you know, really sticking to the book. So community service, research, and then I would say extracurricular activities. Like, what are you besides medicine? And I cannot, I can have a whole 30-minute segment talking about how yeah. important it is to engage in hobbies activities outside of medicine because it really kind of gives you more perspective of life it gives you just more things to talk about it basically widens your horizons as a human being now yeah. going back is it easy to do that in school no I like I said in the last um, go live that we had I completely lost who I was in school because all I did was study but you can still have interests. You can still, you know, if I wasn't, you know, bound to the books in the library and stuff like that, what would I want to do? If you already know that you like volleyball, if you like singing, if you're really good at piano, like mm -hmm. add that to your credentials, add that to your CV. If you know other languages, that's really important. Um, being cultural and being um, able to, you know, communicate with other people and being able to, um, have more of like a global perspective of other people and being able to, you know, be human is something that I think looks good on your resume, um, not just being academic, because being a doctor doesn't only entail like studying and taking tests. It, you're a person with a person interaction. So it's really important to have community service as well and um, really highlight on your hobbies. I think that's really important because that's also if you have that on your CV, you know, it's something that really sets you apart from everyone else because everyone will have, you know, transcripts, this, that. But if you did something like really cool, like you started your own, you know, service project or, you know, you, yeah. you started your own sports team at school or something that you really took time to make initiative and do something, I think that really sets you apart. Yeah. And also, like, it seems like it's this, this holistic thing, right? Because you may not have to have time to go to an externship at that residency program that you want to go to. And it seems like these are all things that can kind of help other people know like what you're like or what you would be like. 
or something yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, like, when I was in school, I didn't have that much time to do all the things that I'm interested in doing now. Because I feel like in residency, your schedule is more demanding, but your free time is more flexible to do what you want with versus when you're at school, your free time, you're like, oh my God, I have to study. I have to do this. I have to, you know, I yeah. have to study and cram. Now the studying is different. It's more like localized to certain, it's more specific. It's different. You guys will see when you're in residency too. Um, but if you don't have a lot of time to do stuff in school, talk about what you would do if you had more time, you know, in your mm -hmm. personal statement, say, when I go to this program, or when I become a resident, my goals are to do this, this and that when I graduate from residency, my goals are to do, you know, doctors without borders, like you can talk about things that you want to do without having to do them in the past or currently, because it's not only what you've done in the past, but also what you want to do in the future. That's important too. Wow. I didn't realize there was a personal statement for, uh, Oh yeah. For these programs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a personal statement of like why you, you know, sometimes the questions change, but usually it's, um, kind of along the lines of why did you choose podiatric medicine and surgery? And what do you feel like you contribute in, into, into the field or something like that? Okay. Um, so it's kind of a way where you can talk about your, how you became interested in the field. The way I did my personal statement is how I became interested, what I did in podiatry school to show my interest and what I want to do in the future in residency and beyond. So I kind of broke it down to like past, present, future. And I, okay. I think that time wise gives you a good global representation of what you've done, what you are and what you can contribute in the future. Okay. And then I kind of wanted to go back while we're waiting. Um, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the comment box um, or put it in the question box, and then we'll go ahead and see if we can get those answered for you. Um, but I kind of wanted to go back to um, the licensing exams that, that you're prepping for right now. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So do you want me to talk about, like, the time frame of between, like, certification and qualification and stuff? So you guys can have an idea because I had no idea about this before residency. So I think yes. it might be helpful. Yes, and then we definitely. can maybe go into like studying um, prep and stuff like that. Um, so the ABFAS, which is the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery, we'll start with that. Basically, like I said before, you take your, it's a two part series for both exams for the ABPM and the ABFAS for both boards. So I'm going to start with the surgical branch. So ABFAS, our part one, which is the, Qualification exam is March 11th. So this basically, if you pass it, you basically get into this pool where you can become certified and take this and sit for the certification exam later on down the road. So after you pass your first part, which for us, like I said, is March 11th, then you basically become qualified. After that, you have seven years to get all the numbers and all the cases and all the criteria that ABFAS requires for you to actually sit and take part two. Okay. So some people get it sooner than others. Some people can get their numbers in three, four years, depending on how busy their practice is or their hospital is. Um, okay. Some people choose to be part-time, so it might take a little bit longer. Okay. But needless to say, after you take part one, you have seven years to basically get all your cases and um, sit for the part two exam. So that's kind of like the time frame. Now, the other exam, ABPM, I was just looking at the criteria because it recently changed in 2019. Mm -hmm. It has different criteria of whether you're in like, you previously were in like a 12 month residency program, a 24 or a 36. Now most of them are 36 and most of them 36 months. And then most of them for the criteria that I'll, I'll talk about, it includes everybody that's gonna finish residency after 2015, which is, me, you, everyone, all mostly, of us, yeah, <laughs> mostly in the chat here. Okay, so for that, after you finish residency, you have basically five years to take the first part, um, which is your uh, qualification exam. Most of the people that are taking it in residency, that's the test that we'll be taking May 19th. But even okay. if you don't take it May 19th, you don't have to. We, it's a good idea to take it because you, you might as well just take it during residency. But yeah. if, some, if you know, the date's not right, you don't feel ready, you don't want to take it, after you gradu graduate residency, you have five years to take part one. Now, 
after you take part one, you can certainly take part two at a time frame later on. There's no time criteria to take that you have to wait or anything like that. Yeah. But if you do not take part one within the first five years, then they basically extend your time frame another five years. But whenever you take part one, you have to take part two the same year and pass both exams. So uh, they'll okay. give you five years to take the first one, but if you lapse that time, then they open up another five-year time frame. But right. as soon as you take part one, you have to take part two the same year and pass that. Okay. Um, so for me, I'm taking it in May, part one. Then you have 10 years to take part two, which is a uh, long time. Um, okay. But, you know, I'm sure they have the time frame for a certain reason. So you have time to take it. You have time to kind of gather your materials and gather your schedule. Um, yeah. So it's not like a time crunch where you have to do it all within the first year after you graduate residency. I yeah. think um, the time frame is very generous, but it's a good thing to, to know before. Um, I think that, you know, you take the exam and everything like that. Yeah. So that's basically the time frame of that. Um, when it comes to studying, a lot of the third years now are in like study cram mode for the ABFAS qualification exam. Yeah. For that, you know, there's, there's so many, um, materials that are online. There's so many, uh, guides that you can study from. So for me, I like to do system based things. Um, so board vitals, I found very helpful for part two of the NBPME exam that we had to take in school. They have a uh, board vitals for the ABP, uh, the ABPM, the ABFAS. So I think board vitals is basically the number one thing I'm using right now because basically what boards vitals is, if you guys don't know what it is, it is a question bank and it goes by exam. So I'm right now doing the ABFAS. The ABFAS then branches rear foot questions and then four foot questions. And then within those criteria, it umbrellas like different topics. So it could be medicine, it can be complications, it can be surgical technique. So board vitals is a big, huge question bank. Like each one has like over like a thousand questions or so, like for rear foot and four foot. Um, and then what's nice about this question bank is you can tailor it if you want to do study mode or if you want to do like exam mode so mm -hmm. you can get the answer as soon as you select an answer or you can take like let's say a bulk of 50 questions and then get the answers later what's nice about board vitals is that they have a really good explanation of why they chose that answer and why those other answers are wrong mm -hmm. and anything interactive like that i think i learned best um what's also nice about that is like after their little blurb of explanation they have like a resource that you can go and kind of read more about that topic um the way i like to study is doing questions if i get something wrong then i go on google i google topic like all like let's say i get a question wrong about clubfoot i'll just mm -hmm. google clubfoot and then orthopedia like will come up um like ortho bullets there's all these other online resources that you can use to kind of like read around the topic okay. so that's kind of like how i like to do it um, I've reached out to other people and kind of tried to gauge like what they're studying. There's so many resources out there for ABFAS. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are question banks. A lot of them are like case prep. So there's a lot. Some of them tend to be really pricey. Like there's some that are like $600, some of them are oh, wow. $300. Um, if your residency has CME that they provide for the residents, you can certainly use that money for board prep. Um, but board vitals, uh, I know our residency pays for that. So that's really nice. And then another thing, and I know um, the ABPM team is on uh, our chat as well. They also have an app that they have questions that kind of are broken down every week with different subjects. So there's certain questions for medicine. There's certain questions for biomechanics. There's certain questions for like surgery. So those are really helpful as well. Um, so there's an app that you can get on your phone. It's the ABPM app. Um, just type in ABPM on the you know the the search whatever search you have with whether that's apple or mac or whatever um certainly get that there's really good information about that and updates on like their exam as well okay. and honestly studying just like random stuff um three things that i wanted to talk about that i wish someone had told me when i was in school when i was studying for exams i came across three youtube channels that were like lifesavers because I cannot sit and just read a book. I can't. Yeah, I, I'm right I, there with you. 
I am visual. I'm, I love interaction. Like I like to yes. take questions online. I like videos. I'm very visual and I need to hear something like yeah. some of my friends, they're like, Oh, I'm just reading the glamorous for my boards. I'm like, that's 2000 pages. Like I yeah. can't do that. Like as soon as I get to page a hundred, I'm just going to forget. Like I need yes. to understand and really see the material, hear the material. Um, so I really like anything interactive and yeah. my goal after graduation of like residency and going into fellowship, I want to do something interactive like that, where I talk about ABFAS topics, ABPM topics, and like kind of just explain it the way that I learned them. So yeah. it's like easy for you guys to kind of have like one channel on YouTube or something where, you know, you can talk where you can learn about podiatric medicine and like topics like that. But that's a discussion that would for another be, day. Yes, that would that's be awesome. One of my goals, I hope but... you can do that. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll start that in fellowship. I'm sure I'll have so much time. Probably not, but on the weekends, we'll see. I don't know. But anyways, going back to the resources. So there's three things on YouTube that I absolutely love. One is called MedCram, um, M-E-D-C-R-A-M, MedCram. This MD has amazing medicine videos, and they're handwritten, and sometimes he talks, and it, they're just easy to follow, explains it, and breaks down topics very easily to understand. Um, the second is Khan Academy. Khan Academy basically has anything you want to learn about any topic from, like, third grade to college and beyond. They have like MCAT prep, they have nursing yes. board prep. So that if you go into friend. like, yeah, so it's called Khan <laughs> Academy, it's free. And that's what I love about platforms like that, that they provide yeah. free education. And I think that's so, that's like priceless, so important. you know, yes. that's so yeah. important because there's yeah. so many people that want to learn so many things that they can't afford like $600 board prep or, you know, right. they just want to learn a topic and it's just free. So I love what Khan Academy stands for, and I love like their mission of teaching for free and everything like that. Yeah. Um, but under their MCAT tab, they have like different medicine videos, and it's such a good way to like recap like the endocrinology system, things that we don't commonly see on a day to day basis. Um, they do a really good job of breaking it down and explaining it in a way where you can remember it for a longer period of time than just after an exam. So um, kind of so like backtracking. So this qual these qualification exams. Like, mm -hmm. what sort of topics do they talk about? Because it seems like they go all the way back to, to like, <laughs> part one stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, with the way they test it is they'll, okay, so to kind of answer your first part. So the ABFAS, they have um, a section on, like, complications, getting patients ready for surgery, um, complications during surgery, surgical technique. They have a medicine um, topic what else they have like different criteria um but when it comes to going back to like part one stuff like there'll be stuff that physiology wise pharmacology wise pathology wise they'll kind of tie in into like a clinical vignette uh, most okay. of it is more for like the medicine section when we kind of go back to part one studying um they'll talk about like ekg sometimes so yeah it's really important to kind of continue the reading and continue like the medicine studying as you're kind of going through your schooling, your residency, mm -hmm. because that's going to come up on boards as well. Um, mm -hmm. But Khan Academy MedCram, and then there's this other guy that makes amazing videos and he does them all by hand, like the drawings and everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys know about him, but his name is Armando Hasudangan, and he is an artist, he's into medicine, and he makes all these visuals and all these charts. I can certainly type up something and then just put it on my story so you guys don't have to sit and write all these things down. <laughs> Whatever I talk about resource-wise, I'll certainly share with you. Um, but those three, I still go back and like refer to those videos to this day, and I will continue to do so, especially for the ABPME. Anything medicine-wise, those yeah. videos are just they become ingrained in your head. Um, and then I looked into when I was taking the second part, um, the NBPME second part, we had, you guys have sketchy micro and all that stuff. You guys know about that? I know about it. Yeah. But we actually have to buy it separately if we want to get access to it. We have a yeah. couple of the micro and a couple of the farm, but okay, yeah. How helpful did you find those? Uh, so when I was taking the test and I was studying, the only thing that was slowly coming out was the sketchy micro. And I was like, this stuff is amazing. Like, I still remember, like, the little doodles and the little pictures. Um, so now I actually looked into it this morning so we can talk about it during this discussion. 
Yeah. Now they have sketchy path, sketchy internal medicine, sketchy farm, and sketchy micro. So I'm like, uh, like that's, that's amazing. amazing. Okay. You okay. probably do have to buy everything separate. Um, but if there's a certain topic that you really feel like you really need to understand more, that you're really struggling, it's something to consider. Okay. Um, so those are like the online stuff that I, I found very helpful. Any questions from the audience? No? Anything right now? No, we have more people joining in. But yeah, if you have okay. any questions, go ahead and put it in the question box if you just joined. Um, another thing that I'll briefly talk about, um, the things that I found helpful for part one was the USMLE book. There's certain okay. sections that I found very important um, that kind of pertain more to us. But part one is very generic. You know, they talk about farm, they talk about micro path, and it's kind of like all over the place. This does a really good job about talking about the high yield stuff. Um, okay. So for part one, part two is more clinical. Um, a lot of the second years already, most of the second years already took, or I'm sorry, most of this fourth years already took that exam, but there's an other USMLE step two, and that's like more of like the clinical knowledge book. This is really good, and I really like like the muscular cell, the musculoskeletal stuff, the dermatology stuff. Um, this is also like a really nice like review high yield stuff that I found helpful. Um, and then, do you guys know about the recall books? No. So there's <laughs> recall books. Um, what I love about these books is that it's question, answer, question, answer. It's not just like dreaded pages of text that you're just like, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm reading. So what is nice about any of these recall books. Oh, is okay. Yeah. So like, like the Deja reviews. Yeah. So okay. these are really good. I find these really helpful and easy to learn from because they're so, you know, focused on the topic and it's just question, answer, question, answer versus just reading paragraphs. Um, the pharmacology recall is good and the medicine recall is really good. I found those two really helpful and I kind of oh refer God. back to them to this day too. Um, so yeah, I think those are most of the things that I found most helpful when it comes to prep. Um, board prep, what's the topic? Yeah, more specific to pod. Uh, I did briefly talk about the USMLE books and um, how those can be helpful more for like part one and part two. Part one, I think the USMLE book is helpful because it talks about a lot of the topics that were tested on. Step two, the clinical knowledge. Um, there's only certain parts that you can see that I, I really reuse, but it, it's very helpful um, when it comes to like mnemonics and high yield stuff that we can use for part two and even for part three if you want to use that. Um, do you know of any doing look intense and what that's like? Okay, that's really interesting that you asked that um, because I learned, does anybody know what locum tenens is? I was going to ask that. I was like, what is that? <laughs> so um, locum tenens is basically where you don't get a full-time job somewhere for a long contract time. You kind of just do little work. You're almost like a satellite podiatrist or a satellite doctor going from different places to different places. Um, mm -hmm. There is one doctor, only one doctor that I've met that had done that. And it's he said that it's very hit or miss because – you don't really do too much research about the job. They kind of just, you know, you can pick where you want to go, but the options are kind of limited and there's not longevity within that career. I think mm -hmm. if you're kind of starting off and you really don't know exactly what you want to do, it's a good option because you can pick and choose where you want to go or what kind of setting. Um, so also the locum tenens is also used for, um, if someone is like doing a private practice and you know, they're like, Oh, I have to go for Europe to six for six months or something like that. I need someone to take over and really learn and kind of cover for me. It's almost like you can apply to do that and take over their practice for a little bit, or it's almost like part-time positions that you have. I don't know. I, I don't have too much research about that. Um, I do have some people that have liked it and some people that were like, you know, they sent me into like you know, the farmland and I'm a city person and this is not something that I'm interested in and like the, the population and the type of trauma, it wasn't for me. I think it's really up to you of what you want to do with it. Honestly, I, I, some people hate it. Some people love it. You're basically kind of, is that yeah, something you're you like do like out of, you do that, you, do you apply to or is that something that you do like, no, is yeah, that you its own entity? It. 
Okay. Yeah, there's like different websites online that you can apply for like locum job like locum jobs like uh, that. They're basically okay. like floaters. And sometimes okay. on their application they'll be like, We need someone for two weeks, we need someone for two months, we need someone for, for six months or a year or something. So you're mm -hmm. basically like a floater for a given amount of time. If you're someone that doesn't know where you want to live, doesn't know if you want to do private practice or what kind of podiatric medicine you want to focus on, I don't think it's a bad idea to start to get your feet wet and kind of see what you like. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not that much longevity. You do get more experience because you get to different places, you get to go travel, um, but there's not longevity in, in a certain field or a certain hospital or certain job with that. But it's not a bad idea to kind of um, go out and, and see what's out there if you're interested in working and seeing different options for yourself. So we've kind of been, we've gone a little bit over time, so I want to start no. to kind of wrap things up. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, you can definitely put it in the box. And if we aren't able to answer it right now, um, I'm sure you can, uh, you can DM us or, or Dr. Katerina and get those questions answered later. Um, yeah. But is there, um, let's see if there's, yeah, because I think we're starting to get a little bit off topic from boards. So yes, wanna, yes. Like, <laughs> wrap up stuff about boards and then maybe like if you want to say a little bit about your fellowship, but maybe that can be a talk for another time. Yeah, we can certainly talk about fellowship and beyond definitely at another time. I mean, I know that's like a big topic because some yeah. people don't know whether they should pursue fellowship or not. And I think that's like a totally different topic on its own because yeah. then people open up the doors of what kind of fellowships are there and stuff like that. Um, exactly. for anybody going back to the board stuff, um, if anybody is like stressed about a board exam or stressed about exams, stuff like that, what I like to think about every time I walk into exam, I like give myself a mental talk and I'm like, the answers are in front of you. It's multiple choice. Like the answers are in front of you. You just have to yeah. pick the right one. And then that slowly kind of like comes you down. Yeah, yeah. It's like the answers are right there. They're right in front of you. And most of the questions you can eliminate at least 50%. So you have to f basically a 50, 50 chance of getting it right. If you can yeah. do that. Um, and then one thing I will leave you guys and please message me if you have any additional questions. Um, I found this quote today that I thought was like super cool and I wanted to share with you guys. So I saw this quote and it read, I started making so much more progress in life when I stopped trying to calm the storm and I calmed myself instead. It's not about avoiding the storm. It's about surviving them. So I thought that that was really cool because yeah. we all go through shit in school and residency and life. Oh, and yeah. Personal lives. And it's not just preventing the storm from happening. It's just calming yourself and just getting through it. And that's the best advice I can give you today. <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful advice. I think uh, I know we have like we just got out of I think how many has it been like five exams or six exams over the last two weeks. We I have know. another one coming up. So I know. Um, that's hard. definitely good advice. And I'm going to like keep that in. Um, and our goal lives are probably going to start getting a little bit dwindled because second year life is definitely kicking in a lot. So yeah. um, I don't really want to take up too much more of your time because I know you're you're busy studying for, for all these exams yeah. coming up. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, yes. just as a quick wrap up, uh, thank you again for joining of us and I imparting all of your wisdom. <laughs> Anytime. Um, and then another reminder that we do have the giveaway um, up and running with many things. So Dr. Katerina uh, designed these uh, medical enamel pins. So definitely go and check them out. Um, there's a couple that we have highlighted. You're not limited. The winners aren't win uh, limited to just pick from those. You can pick any of those. Um, but that contest is running for the next two weeks. So uh, there's more information on that uh, on our Instagram page. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, of course. Hope you guys have a nice weekend. Yes, you too. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye. Bye, guys.